Chapter 5, Communications and Documentation. Communications are important in every phase of a call. The dispatcher must communicate with the, lo the location and the type of call to the responders. The emergency medical responder needs to communicate with patients, bystanders, family members, uh, people just happen to be in the court. Also, they need to communicate with people that may be helping them, uh, safety officials, fire department, things like that. After a call, you must document, document the condition of the patient. All of these things are vitally important um, for continuation of treatment or for the continuity of the treatment of the patient involved. Okay. The purpose of communication is to send and receive information from one location to another. Um, we can't always communicate face to face. Sometimes we must communicate um, using the most available or the best available resource that we have. Okay, results of using communication systems will only be as accurate as the information we put onto the system. Communications can be divided into two main categories, voice calls and data. Uh, much like we use um, normal telephone, uh, cell, cell phone, radio uh, calls, we can also set with data or transmit data via tablets, um, systems like Telegram, WhatsApp, things like that, um, and sending data, not only patient information, but also vital things like pictures and that type of thing. Voice communications is spoken word, okay, from one location to another. Please make sure when you're communicating uh, with spoken word with voice systems, Okay, we understand the regulations that we're using, those type of things. There are people that control uh, the use of radios, whether it be on a small system or on a large system. Okay, radios uh, would have a base station where the main operations would be. Mobile radios, which would be carried with the patient or the, with, the, with the responder. Um, portable radios, uh, repeaters. Whenever you have a repeater, you have a network of radios that that, that that repeat backwards and forwards. Okay, they bounce from one uh, tower to the next. Okay, telephone systems, your primary um, uh, source of voice voice messaging, okay. Landlines, there's still landlines. People use landlines, although um, these things are not as good in South Africa anymore as they used to be. Uh, most of the things have gone to mobile phones, which are on radio waves with towers, cellular towers, with batteries that send and receive messages. Okay. Data can be transmitted through radios, phones, or the internet, okay, paging systems. Yeah, in the good old days, we used to have pages that used to come up with messages that we had to phone in. They sent messages across the, or the airways, just giving us numbers and things like that to phone people, data information, things like that, mobile data terminals, like a tablet, can also be used to send messages through a radio system. All right, fax machines used um, to <laughs> telephone lines. I'm not sure if anybody even uses fax machines anymore. Um, they're pretty much obsolete. Uh, tele telemetry uh, is used by advanced life support providers to transmit ECGs and other patient information and data on online medical control. Digital messages, including email, text messages, and social media can be transmitted via a wide variety of things. Um, let's see. Uh, functions of radio communications. Obviously, we need to be dispatched. Uh, we need to tell the people where to go to. We need to provide information. 
It is your responsibility to keep your equipment ready to receive a call, batteries charged, things like that. Um, all those on, all those with sound turned up. If you're not sure all the information is co received correctly, ask the dispatcher to repeat it. In fact, it's always a good idea to read it back um, into your dispatcher so they can confirm that you've got everything right. We need to know how to use maps or GPS. Uh, these days, it's quite easy to send a location on these different things. Um, drop a pin, and then people can relay that information to the next person. Once we arrive on scene, we need to um, give the communications of uh, center, the mobile center, the, the base, um, tell them where we are, what we found, any types of hazards that are present, number of patients, uh, additional resources, maybe you need an extra ambulance, maybe you need a fire department that draws a lot, things like that. Um, all those things are, are additional information required. Uh, hazards are definitely an important thing to relay. Update the EMS units, your things. Your update should include things like the age and sex of the patient, chief complaint, levels of responsiveness, vital signs, base vital signs maybe, um, and status of the airway, breathing, and circulation. Transferring care to EMS personnel, in other words, a handoff or handover, um, needs to be done with a full history of what you found and your treatment of the patient so far. Okay. Using the same approach as the following during the patient assessment, age and sex of the patient can be provided, brief history of the incident, uh, the patient's chief complaint, spatial level of consciousness, baseline vitals, how you found the patient. Okay, uh, we always want to try and report the status of the patient, the vital signs, airway, breathing, circulation. Best drive, best. Uh, Describe the, the physical examination you did, primary survey, secondary survey, always remember to find a sample history. Um, it's always a very, very good way of getting information. And report the interventions provided and the patient's response to them. Always describe the patient's response. Remember, um, we want to make sure that the patient is responding well. If the patient isn't responding well, then we must try something else. It doesn't help to try the same thing over again. So we would like to try and and get as much information for the patient as possible. Okay, okay. All right, online medical control generally used by EMTs and paramedics is a secure permission to perform certain skills. We have to have permission to do anything before we can touch a patient. Get direction regarding patient care if we need to refer to somebody with a bit of higher knowledge than what we know. And uh, it's obviously used for patient care reports to a hospital. Certain um, emergency services have direct links to certain hospitals and they would send information back and forth regarding the patient. Personal activities after you've turned over the patient care to uh, higher, higher help or higher trained help, you need to report your status back to the communication center, you need to report back on duty or standing down, getting fuel, cleaning ambulance, things like that. Okay, we let the communication center how, know how long it will take for you to get the unit ready for the next service. And as soon as you are available, please report to the base that you're available to take another call. Okay, online medical control is generally used for EMTs and paramedics. Okay, we got that one. General guidelines for effective radio communications. Uh, just if I can explain briefly, always speak clearly and slowly. Always say something like out or over when you can finish your sentence so the other person can um, start talking back to you. Okay, be brief. If your message takes more than 30 seconds to send, pause after 30 seconds and ask you a copy. Maybe they're not hearing you. Okay. Uh, um, avoid negative chatter over the radio. 
Just remember, sometimes your patient can hear what you're saying and they won't want to be feeling your negative vibes. Okay. When we're transmitting a number with two more more per digits, say the entire number first, and then it say each number separately. For example, uh, sixty-seven, followed by six seven. Forgive for whatever you do. Do not use profanity over the radios. It's frowned upon by the legal services, uh, the people that control the use of radios. Okay, and only use the frequencies of com or communication that is the, uh, assigned to you and try and remove as much background noise as possible. If you need to, close windows, close doors, things like that if you're in a moving vehicle. Effective communication that the person receiving the message understands what the person who has sent it has meant. Effective communication requires feedback. I said to you just now, might be sometimes best to repeat back what you've received. The receiver needs to communicate to the sender that the message has been received and understood. These are all as good, good. Okay, there can be no broken telephone effects. Both external and internal distractions can negatively affect your communication. Things like noise, um, beeping sounds, sirens, all those type of things that are external. Um, could uh, could um, disrupt your 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 communication process. Internal distractions uh, don't let yourself um, think about personal matters. While on scene, you need to be clear of mind. Um, don't let the noise in your brain affect your communications to your base or to your patient. Okay, so when two are dealing with. Uh, Patients, when we communicate with patients, always introduce yourself by your name and your title and ask the patient's name. Always get the person. If you can't understand what the patient is saying, always use ma'am or sir or things like this. Try and um, establish a uh, Kalana communication with your patient that is understandable, easily understandable for the patient. Okay, maybe they're half deaf or, or, or hard of hearing. Speak slowly, clearly, and always face your patient while you're talking to them. Okay, always tell the truth. Um, no matter how bad things are, tell the truth. Uh, we're not going to tell the patient, look, you're going to die now. But you can always tell your patient things aren't looking good, but help is on the way. Um, and, and try and keep the spirits up. Allow time for the patient to respond Okay. Um, if you need to repeat, always repeat the same words again and use positive gestures, smiles and things like that. Uh, limit the number of people who are talking to the patient. You know, you, you need to communicate clearly. There can't be other people trying to say the same thing and other things all at the same time. Like I said, your body language needs to be confident, clear. Uh, happy, smiling, jovial, almost makes the patient feel a lot better, makes him more comfortable with what's going on. Obviously, we need to respect cultural norms of the patient. Um, certain cultures don't like to be uh, told what to do, handle things like that by people that are not from their religious status and things like that. Um, so we try and we try and be respectful of these people and these things. Show the utmost respect at all times. Use open-ended and closed questions, appropriate closed-ended questions appropriately. Um, sometimes it's always just easier to use yes and no's and things like that. Treat patients as if they were your own family members. It was kindness, sympathy, empathy, and always like they belong to you or they 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 they, they um post members of your family patients who are hard of hearing the deaf as i spoke to you just now about identify yourself telling the patient your badge or your patch or whatever the case might be if you have one of the things um, touch the patient in an appropriate manner the hand hold the hand whatever the case might be on the hand on the shoulder while you're talking to them. Okay, face the patient when you speak so she or he can read your lips, your facial expressions. 
speak slowly, distinctly, do not shout. Watch the patient's expressions, see if they understand or if they're confused or uncertain about things. Okay. Repeat your phrase, use clear, simple languages, always use the same words. And if nothing else works, you can always write it down. Patients who are visually impaired, okay, uh, tell the patients what's happening, try and identify the noises that are going on, if they look confused, upset by things, by certain sounds, describe the situation, describe the surroundings, tell them step by step what's happening. Um, it's probably more important than ever to speak to the patient that's called visually impaired because the patient is, 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 is confused. They don't know what's going on. We need to try and calm them down and we need to get them to listen clearly to what you're saying and tell them constantly what you're doing. Don't stop telling them. If they have a service dog, please try and keep the dog and the patient together uh, at all times, a familiar surrounding for patients um, and some familiar things with them. It helps them relax and feel at ease a lot better. Okay. It's not necessary to talk louder to a patient that is visually impaired, okay? They are not deaf, they can't see. Okay, non-English speaking patients, well, this is always quite a, 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 a difficult thing to, to muster up. Um, you need to find out how much English they can speak. If you can't find out how much English they know, um, find an interpreter who can speak to them you can tell them what they need to know. Use hand gestures, finger pointing, facial expressions, any way possible to try and explain what you're needing to get across to them. <laughs> it's always a bit difficult and it's, a, it's, it's like um, a turkey shoot. You, you never know what they understanding by what you're saying. But always be positive, always treat, always have permission to treat first and try and find somebody who can speak the person's language. Okay, when dealing with old patients, old patients have physical and mental impairments. Okay, we need to assess the situation carefully, um, try and have a familiar person around, a familiar person that can help you, that can help you reassure the patient. Okay, because sometimes, and in fact, quite often older patients need to be reassured that they're doing the right thing because they don't understand properly what's going on around them, especially people with things like um, dementia and those kind of things. Pediatric patients now with this, it's very, very difficult sometimes to treat with these people. Um, we need familiar uh, faces, objects, teddy bears, things like that help reduce the fear of the children. Talk both to the parents and the child as much as possible and tell them about what's happening. We need to explain to them what we're doing step by step. We need to be down on the same level as the child if possible so that we can uh, we can, we can can bring ourselves down to their level. They can understand us easier. If we're looking at them and they see our smiley, happy faces, then they are quite told and they would be more open to responding to you remember children don't really talk if they're afraid they 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 just keep quiet rather rather than, than explain to you what's going on um if they have uh an adult or somebody that's with them a granny mother father whatever a carer then they fall more likely to open up to you and always tell them what you your first name explain to them what they do what you're doing and make uh, a, a, almost like a little game of it if you can um, to get as much information from the child as possible. And the children can't always explain things, what's happening, how they're feeling and where pains and things like that is. Spoke about getting down, making eye contact, be honest, always. We, I can't reiterate enough how important it is to be honest with your patient at all times. If it's going to hurt, so it's going to hurt. All right, patients with a disability, developmental disability, um, we need to obviously communicate with the family. Um, because so often people, patients with things like autism or special needs, Down syndrome, things like that, 
They don't always talk, they don't always respond. So we need to speak slowly and in short sentences and use simple words. Okay. And repeat the phrases several times until the patient understands. Repeat it so that the carer or the family member understands. And they maybe have a different way of communicating or different way of expressing themselves to these children. Okay, um, people with disruptive behavior, <laughs> um, we need to assess the situation carefully before we, we treat the patient. Remember safety first, safety is the most important thing to you and the crew that are coming. Okay, protect yourself and the patient. Never let the patient get behind you or block the exit. Don't take your eyes off the patient. Don't turn your back. In fact, try and keep eye contact as much as possible. Don't cause a confrontation, but also don't back down. Don't show that you're intimidated at any time. If the patient has a weapon, stay clear and wait for help to come. Remember, with these kind of people, with especially um, violent psychotic behavior, always you need to have your patient restrained before you can treat anything. I would not ever suggest you put yourself in danger um, with a patient that's violent. Okay. Uh, these people, you can't take a disruptive patient to hospital against his or wishes. It would be um, abduction, kidnapping, whatever the case might be. You can't treat a patient that doesn't want to be treated. It would be considered assault. Okay, but if you do think the patient is a danger to themselves, get your law enforcement involved. If you think they're a danger to the community, get your law enforcement involved immediately. And don't, whatever you do, don't turn your back on that patient.